welcome to our uh, monthly lunch lecture. I'm so glad that you have decided to spend some time with us today. Uh, joining us today is Dr. Shelley Klein from the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education. Um, she is one of our um, frequent lecturers and we're very pleased to have her back. She was also our lecturer for this month's Evening at Ease program. And that video you can find on our YouTube channel. Today, Dr. Klein will speak specifically about Americans and the Holocaust. Um, Dr. Klein, I'll throw it over to you. Please introduce yourself a moment. Thank you, and thank you all for having me back again. It's always great to be speaking with the Eisenhower Presidential Library and Museum. Uh, I am Shelley Klein. I'm the Historian and Director of Education at the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education in Overland Park, Kansas. Um, I've been there for about six years now. Uh, and I'm a European historian, so I do uh, a variety of things. And my specialty, of course, is the Holocaust. And in my own research, I focus on gender and the Holocaust. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, can I jump right in, Don, or do I have to throw it back to you? No, please begin. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Klein. Yes. So this, uh, what I will be speaking about today, Americans in the Holocaust, was actually a, a, a fun presentation for me to put together. Um, which I did back in the fall, but for the very first time, because this allows me, you know, as a, you know, a European historian, I'm used to looking at the Holocaust and that period, mostly through the lens of Europe. And so with this project, I was able to look at what's happening in America. What's the perspective of Americans during this time period? Um, a lot of what you will see today is based on a temporary exhibit at the um, museum in DC, the National uh, Holocaust Museum. and it's an excellent, excellent temporary exhibit. So when things open up and if you're traveling, it's absolutely worth going to see. And they have a really good online version of the exhibit as well. So um, a lot of what I, I have is pulled from their online exhibit. So um, I can't recommend it enough, but what they did very purposely is call this exhibit Americans and the Holocaust, not just America. And I think too often we don't make the distinction between a country nationwide policy and the people within the country and the individual thoughts and opinions that they have. And so with this exhibit and today with my presentation, we will look to see what are the concerns of everyday Americans? What are their opinions? Not just what is the national policy, we'll see what that is too, um, but what are, you know, what is the on a, the ground opinion? Because as we know, even in our own time, um, there can be a national policy towards an international event, but all of us may feel and think differently about that. The other thing I'd like to say at the beginning is we know uh, how the story ends, right? We know that in, you know, we look at the 1930s and we know that by 1945, six million Jews are, will be dead. We know uh, that there's a massive war coming. But we have to keep in mind that, of course, people didn't know that then, right? So there is a tendency, especially when we look at this period in American history, to read history backwards instead of reading it forward and seeing, um, you know, what were the priorities of people at the time? What knowledge did they have? What didn't they know? Um, and then ultimately, we can ask ourselves, you know, what did America do and what more could have we done? So keep those things in mind as we move forward. All right, I'm gonna put myself in presenter mode. And once I get there, Don or Samantha, give me some feedback on making sure it looks like it should. Okay, does this uh, look like it should? It's great, Shelly, thank you. Perfect, all right, thanks so much. All right, this is just a fast little video that I, uh, again, from the museum, and I want you to it's a great recap of what America looked like immediately after World War I, um, before things get into uh, the depression. Thank <laughs> you. 
So I think that sums up well uh, what America looked like in that period. And I think, again, one of the things we have to remember is we're used to America being superpowers on the international stage. And World War I was really our first big appearance. Um, after the war, of course, we retreated into isolationism again. And even though Woodrow Wilson wanted us to join the League of Nations, um, we did not. We will decrease the size of our military. Um, there's a fear of communism because of what's happened in Russia with the Russian Revolution and other revolutionary attempts throughout Europe. So we will become much more insular and have you know, more broadly a fear of outsiders. This is also a time when the Klan will make a huge resurgence. And in fact, in the 1920s, it has its highest membership um, ever. And it's a time when it also broadens its sort of scope of hate to include people beyond just uh, blacks, but also to include Catholics, Jews, and foreigners. Um, because Klan membership is so high, it will surge to two to eight million members in the 20s. This means there'll be a lot of Klan members that are actually involved in politics, both at state and local levels. This will influence policy in many ways, and one major way we see this happen is in the immigration quotas that are put into place uh, in the 1920s. This is system of uh, limiting immigration based on a person's country of origin is something that will come up time and time again here in the, the next hour as I talk, uh, but this basically will preference people from Northern and Western Europe and keep out people from Southern, Eastern Europe, and certainly from Asia and Africa. Uh, Great Britain and Germany will have like the highest number of uh, people that are let in. This is often the reason, there's many reasons for these quota systems, but partially this is rooted in a belief in eugenics. And this is something that isn't just confined to the US or Germany, but is a you know Western wide system of pseudoscientific belief, uh, the thought there was sort of a hierarchy of races. And so we wanted the best, most intelligent people coming into the US. Um, and so we preferenced our um, immigration accordingly. It's a height of anti-Semitism in America. Actually, the 1920s represent um, a 20th century high for anti-Semitism. And you'll see lots of new groups appearing in the 20s. Um, famous people like Father Coughlin and Henry Ford will be reproducing and publishing the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, this 19th century forgery that says Jews control the world. Um, so that will be disseminated widely. Um, so you can see that this, this is a period of anti-Semitism and certainly that will influence views towards um, Jewish refugees and immigrants later on. We can't forget that we have our own serious racial problems in this time. Um, there are a lot of race riots immediately following World War I. Um, some, the summer of 1919 is often called the Red Summer because there are so many violent acts against um, communities of color. Black codes are enforced. Um, there's increased migration to northern cities, which then often sparks acts of violence in those northern cities against these new communities. Um, so it's, it's a really turbulent time um, and one in which we're certainly grappling with a lot of violence in the US. Most notably, this time is known <clears throat> for the Great Depression. Our economy crashes in 1929. Um, a quarter of all workers are going to be unemployed. So this is really what's on Americans' minds. When we think about what are people thinking about in the 1930s, um, <clears throat> obviously it's, it's the Great Depression. And much of FDR's first term will entirely be focused on restoring economic stability. What's happening in Germany? They too are in the midst of a Great Depression because we lent them a bunch of money in the 20s, which stabilized their economy and brought um, a pretty productive period in the Weimar Republic that most people don't even think about. But when our economy tanks, we call in our loans from Germany, their economy tanks, the depression happens. And that depression caused by ours uh, is what creates the ground for the Nazi party to rise to prominence. Um, <clears throat> these are some of the election posters from those early um, elections, the election of 1932, which will eventually uh, bring the Nazi party into power. But if you look at these, um, you know, especially these ones of, you know, the men, these lines, this could be America, right? You see one poster says, our last hope is Hitler. Um, another one, you know, shows these sort of other factory workers. These are people out of work who want to be put back to work. They want food, freedom, um, there's a lot of soft peddling of the anti-Semitism in these early posters. Mostly, people want to go back to work. So the messaging there is not unlike our own. When Hitler does come to power in 32, it's because the Nazi party has gained 37% of the national uh, seats in the Reichstag. Hitler is not, the Nazi party is not elected in a landslide by any means. They just get the largest minority party. Because of that, um, 
he's the leader of their party. And because they're the largest minority party, Hindenburg agrees to make him chancellor. This is also, of course, the same time that Roosevelt um, comes to his first term. So just quickly, what's happening in Germany? Um, you see pretty quickly after Hitler uh, becomes chancellor, there are boycotts of Jewish businesses, um, discrimination laws pa pr passed against uh, Jews, just makes it a little bit harder for Jews to be Jews and a little bit harder for Jews to be German. There will be laws limiting um, the amount of Jewish students that can go to university, keep them from taking professional exams like the bar exam, um, remove Jews from social clubs. So basically these early restrictions will really start to undo a lot of the assimilation and integration um, that had been going on in Germany for you know, a long time, but particularly in the last hundred years. And then you'll see book burnings happen as well. This is something that struck America and the world because at this time we can't forget that Germany was um, you know, it was a, it was a sophisticated, educated place known for its science and technology, um, a place of yeah culture and education. It would be weird, and it was weird to see them actively um, burning books and revolting against education. So um, this was this was something people noticed. Fast forward a couple years, the Nuremberg Laws are changes to the German Constitution that happened in 1935. This will now make the party symbol and colors the national symbol. Um, it will strip Jewish uh, Germans of their German citizenship, and it makes uh, intermarriage or sexual relations between Jews and non-Jews illegal. So these are changes to the Constitution. People noticed it. Uh, and then you'll see public signs going up outside of cities and universities declaring that the Jews are not wanted here. Um, Time magazine here in America uh, in 1933 will feature uh, Goebbels on the cover, long story inside about, you know, him and the Nazi party. Uh, and the cover caption says, quote, even here, you know, never forget it, repeat it a hundred times, you say it in your dreams, the Jews are to blame. Even though the Nazis soft pedal some of their anti-Semitism to be elected, it's no secret that they are an anti-Semitic party. Even here in America, um, in Time magazine, an American could pick up um, this magazine and know immediately that this party stands um, for being anti-Jewish. So how did Americans feel about this? Um, just some responses. When we saw that there were these boycotts of Jewish businesses, um, there were marches and demonstrations around the U.S. You can see here's one photo. Um, so you know, lots of people will turn out for these demonstrations. The problem is there's no sustained movement. There's individual demonstrations here and there, but not a sustained movement. We'll also see um, stamps and buttons and matchbooks and other sort of goods produced that will specifically say, don't buy German goods. Um, and a lot of this is you know, directly resulting from um, this boycott of Jewish businesses. So you can see, again, a level of awareness and a level of everyday interaction that people had in terms of you know, small items and stuff that would remind them of this. Just a quick response to the Nuremberg race laws. This is something that shows up in American newspapers. Um, and not just in New York. So we're going to look at several examples of American um, newspapers throughout this time. We're not just talking about the New York Times or, you know, a newspaper in Chicago. You could, you know, look at the newspaper in Abilene, look at the newspaper uh, in Lawrence, Kansas, wherever you're, you know, watching from around the country. There was, you know, little articles about many of these items really just throughout the country. In 1938, this will be a big year uh, in Europe. It's also an important year in the U.S. because while things started to improve in the, you know, after 35, you start to see some, some change in the Depression. 38, there's another mini recession and things get bad again. So um, it's, it's a, again, a time where American, America is mostly focused on what's happening um, in our own country because things have gotten, again, particularly bad here. There are also um, some people who do sympathize with um, Nazi beliefs. Here's a map that shows various sort of Nazi camps throughout the, um, the country, mostly centered on the coasts. Uh, but there's one in Omaha, you can see that. Um, and there were you know, various groups, the Silver Shirts, I think was one in New York that um, had bookshops and just produced you know, anti-Semitic literature and other sort of like pro-Aryan literature, but this was, you know, something across the country. And then here you also see, you know, people knew about this and then they were also going to protest it. So it wasn't like these were happening in secret. So what's happening in Europe? Um, 1938 marks the first expansion of German territory when uh, Germany will take over Austria. And as soon as they do, 
all of the anti-Jewish laws and practices that they put in place in Germany over the previous years now immediately go into effect in Austria. They will also in 38 go into the Sudetenland, this tiny part of Czechoslovakia. Hitler wanted that section because he said there was German speaking people there and they were being treated badly. So the League of Nations, remember the US is not a part of that. The League of Nations, uh, particularly Great Britain and France are inclined to give Hitler what he wants because they don't want another war. Um, the president of Czechoslovakia is made to sit in the hallway while uh, the great powers of the world divide up his country. And you can see this tiny piece that's given away. They believed they had secured peace in their time. As we know, peace in their time will not last even another year. Also in 38, very importantly, uh, Kristallnacht happens in November. This is a violent pogrom against uh, Jews in Germany, Austria, and the Sudetenland. Um, where Jewish businesses are looted and smashed. It takes its name from the broken glass. Homes are ransacked and burned. Synagogues are burned and destroyed. Jewish men are rounded up uh, and taken to concentration camps as a scare tactic to uh, make their families immigrate. And in the US, there was a ton of coverage. No event during the 12 year Nazi period gets more um, attention in the US uh, press than Kristallnacht. Um, it has a lot of coverage across the country and there's sustained coverage. And if you read some of these headlines, you know, Germans storm the Jews, uh, Nazis war and world Jews will be wiped out unless evacuated by democracies. So it's very clear in these headlines, Nazis are against the Jews. Bad things are coming if the Jews, uh, bad things are coming from, for the Jews from the Nazis. Um, here's just some more. And again, you can see from, from many different places, specifics, mob set fire to synagogues, loose loot and burn shops. Um, so this is something Americans definitely read about for many days afterwards. As a result, um, Roosevelt will extend temporary visas of German Jews who are visiting the US um, and allow them to stay indefinitely. However, um, even though the majority of Americans disapprove of the treatment of Jews in Nazi Germany, you can see this overwhelmingly 94% disapprove. Only 21% believe that we should allow a larger number of Jewish exiles into the US. So there's a real disconnect between seeing something is wrong here, it's bad, and saying, oh yeah, we should let more people in. Because remember, 38, again, a real low in the depression. Um, and so people are worried about foreigners coming in, taking their jobs, also fear of communism. Um, so there's lots of fear that's wrapped up. Um, and even though there is an agreement, this is wrong, uh, there, there is an overwhelming support to change those immigration quotas. Roosevelt will call an international conference, the Evian Conference in 38. Um, and basically the world decides again to do nothing. So they meet, they decide who wants to take, um, who's willing to take more refugees in from, from Germany. Uh, basically most countries decide no, which unfortunately has the effect of signaling to, the, to uh, Germany that the world doesn't really care what happens to its Jewish population. So here we can look at what we are doing in terms of immigration. And we always sort of talk about what's happening in the 30s, but let's just take a brief look back and see what our immigration looked like um, really over the beginning part of the century. You can see from 1900 to 1915, so right before World War I, um, that's when, I mean, immigration is high there, right? You can see like over a million are coming in for several years in a row. It drops off during the war period, understandably, and then really cuts in half after 1924 when the immigration quota system goes into place. So you can see it really drops off dramatically. So because there's only a certain amount of immigration visas within the quota system to be filled, in 1933, this is, you can, this, these are great visuals, we'll go through many years here, um, you can see how many visa spots were to be filled. Um, there's over almost 26,000. And you can see that only 1,200 were issued. And that meant that there were people, the waiting list was three years long, even though the quota, the, the visas were barely filled. Fast forward here again to the 34 to 37 period. Again, um, not filling the available visa spots, barely filling them. And the, now it's a three to four year waiting list um, up to 38. And again, this will really, after Kristallnacht, it's very clear to, to Jews within this territory um, that more violence is coming. A normal life is not possible within Germany and German territory. And Roosevelt combines the German and Austrian, Austrian quotas, which actually reduces the number. 
Um, but even in 38, you can still see that almost 8,000 visas go unused. 39, uh, eve of war. Uh, this is the, I believe, maybe the only year that um, the maximum number of visas are issued. And still, you can see, look how many people are still on that waiting list. 1940, almost all the visas are used, but the waiting list continues to grow as the situation in Europe gets worse. 41, again, backward, he, there's no waiting list. The U.S. is um, now at war, or about to go to war, and so there's, there's still lots of visas that are unused, and the waiting list is canceled. So if you just look at this over this period, you can see um, how many visas were filled, how many were left unfilled. And so very often we talk about, you know, what could have America done in the Holocaust? Should we have changed our quotas? A simple answer is just fill the quotas that we have. So very quickly, and we don't want to belabor this, um, I just want to show you the steps that it took to actually get into, um, to, to immigrate. Um, and there were no special provisions for refugees. So this is the, the process people had to fill. First, you apply for the waiting list. You could expect to be on there to wait at least two years for a visa. Uh, then you have to compile a bunch of documents and think about how difficult it would be to compile these documents from different agencies at a time we don't even have like copy machines. So uh, you would get a birth certificate. Uh, then you would do your visa application. Then there you'd have to have a medical exam to prove that you're disease free and that you would be able to work and wouldn't be a burden when you came to the US. Then you would have to produce a list of property and pay a tax on that. Then uh, you would have to have a, a police interview to state that you were a certificate to show that you were not a criminal. Then you have to find a sponsor. And this was often where people ran into difficulty because you know, maybe they had family in the U.S., maybe they knew somebody, um, maybe they had a vague acquaintance, but a lot of people in the U.S. were unwilling to take on financial responsibility for someone that they didn't know, a distant relative they didn't know, or maybe uh, they had more immediate family that they, they were wanting to help, but those people hadn't decided to get out yet. And so they're like, no, we can't sponsor you because I want to wait to see if my, my cousin needs me. Um, so that was another challenge. And think too, people are writing letters back and forth to get agreement on these sponsorships. That takes time, right? This is an immediate process. So a lot of time is involved in this. Um, then you have to get recommendation letters once you find that sponsor, bank letter, affidavit. Sometimes you need multiple copies of these things. Then you have to buy a ship ticket. Again, that's expensive. Sometimes uh, you would have to like have your paperwork in order in order to get a ship ticket. But other, you know, other places would say you can't have your ticket until you have your paperwork in order. So it's this weird catch-22. How do you get this piece without filling out the other one? Um, so it was a, a real bureaucratic nightmare for many people. In addition to just tickets, you would also need transit visas, landing permits, all sorts of additional paperwork, which, again, took time and stamps and communication. Then you would have an interview um, with the American consulate. And if they're, you know, there might not be a consulate in your city, so you would have to travel to a city who had an American consulate. That takes money and that takes time. Um, and then eventually you would be put to fill one of the quota slots. So I think it's so often we forget about how complicated this step was. Even so, there are many, you know, over half of Germany's Jewish population is able to get out of the country. Not all of them are able to come to the US. Some of them come to neighboring countries, but many of them are able to get out. Um, even so, you can see with this process, it did take a lot of, um, you had to be able to navigate this bureaucracy and that's not something that everyone would be able to do. Um, people who had to, you know, if you have to work, you don't have time to like stand in line for hours at some of these offices. Um, so just thinking about the real complications, sometimes these are referred to as like these paper walls that keep people out. There's also a misunderstanding um, that the U.S. did not take any immigrants, and many of you may be familiar with the story of the St. Louis, which was a ship that came and tried to land in the U.S. in the late 30s. Um, it was scheduled to go to Cuba, and then there were it, it, they couldn't. Cuba didn't let the boat in, and wouldn't come. The U.S. didn't either. Many of the people on board had purchased fraudulent um, visas from a Cuban official, so they just didn't have the right documents. Um, eventually, the ship is turned around, goes back to Europe, um, and about, you know, there's about 900 people on board, 200 of them end up dying during the Holocaust. Um, Britain will take some, France takes some of the passengers. 
Um, but this is probably the most famous example, and often people think it's the only example um, of ships coming to America. So I want to show you this brief graphic just to show you um, the number of ships that in fact do come to the U.S. Then this video is also on USHMM's website. So if you'd like to learn more about the St. Louis, you can certainly see it there in their digital exhibit. And then they'll also st tell the story of another ship uh, that will land in Norfolk, Virginia, and actually uh, does successfully land there. And there's a lot of um, political intervention that happens and everybody from that ship is allowed to dock. At the very end of this video, I won't fast forward because it glitches sometimes, um, it shows you like after 1939, there continues to be some ships coming out um, until you know 1941, they really cut off. But you can see that really at that point, the only ships that are coming to the U.S. are coming from um, Spain and Portugal. So they're they're coming from the you know the southern part of Europe. So you can see from this this graphic, which I think does a great job of showing that there are lots of ships um, that are arriving in the U.S. with immigrants uh, and refugees. And this is just one port. They just did. They just looked at New York. There's also New Orleans. Um, there's lots of other places, you know, ports that would have been taking people. This was the biggest. Um, at the same time, there are many people who are actively working to keep America neutral and keep America out of any sort of European conflict. We see the America First Committee founded in 1940. At the peak of membership, they have 800,000 people. It will be dissolved uh, immediately after uh, Pearl Harbor. You can see that. Charles Lindbergh is the most famous member. He's notoriously pro-German um, and wants to keep Germany strong. Um, so keeps advocates us as staying out of European affairs. I'm going to go through this next set of slides really quickly. I just want you to see how public opinion changes as uh, as the war begins and as you know it starts to change in Europe. So September 1st, you can see uh, Americans polled, did they believe we should send troops abroad to help? Uh, the majority says no, but it's it's a pretty split majority. Uh, when Poland is conquered, an overwhelming majority says, no, stay out. Germany invades Western Europe. Again, overwhelmingly, people say, no, stay out. Um, France falls, moves up a little bit, but again, stay out. Then uh, when we get the military draft in 1940, interestingly, um, the numbers come back up again. And we'll see that even with Roosevelt's election, um, risk getting into war, yes, 60% say we should help. Um, with Lend-Lease, yes, 67% are in favor of helping. Um, Germany's attack at the Soviet Union, okay, we can help. Um, and then, again, it's still staying pretty high here on the verge of war, yes. And then finally, Pearl Harbor, um, should we declare war on Germany as well as Japan? Majority says yes, Hitler does it for us, so we don't have to make that decision. Always keep in mind in this period, even though it is not the same as what's happening in Europe, it is a time when Americans are talking about interning and relocating um, fellow Americans. So this is when we see the internment of Japanese Americans. What does opinion look like on this? Um, overwhelmingly, people are in favor of relocating Japanese non-citizens from the Pacific coast, and 60% say it's okay to move um, U.S. citizens of Japanese descent so that they're not located on the coasts. 
the American focus in this time is, is, you know, we're ramping up for war, mass mobilization. Here's some examples of propaganda you can see. Um, <clears throat> we also have a fear of Americans, of Nazi spies during this time too. So at the same time people are discussing, should we let more immigrants in and refugees in, there's a real fear that among those refugees could be Nazi spies. So what's happening in the Holocaust? Well, we are now newly in war. Um, well, this is the time where the, or about to be in war. Uh, this is the time of the um, Einstadtsgruppen is operating in Eastern Europe. So in June of 41 through, you know, 43 really, um, they're, the first methods of mass murder was this Holocaust by bullets, um, where these Einstadtsgruppen killing units will go into Eastern territory uh, behind the Wehrmacht and murder all of the Jewish people they find in villages and towns and cities. Some of these massacre sites might be small, 20, 50. Some of them are quite large with 33,000 being killed over a period of two days outside of Kiev. Um, so if you just look at this map, I think it's, it's always astounding to see just how many massacre sites there are. In July, they will begin to evolve. So it, it becomes clear that if there is they want to transition to all-out genocide. All of Europe's Jews will be killed. Um, Holocaust by bullets isn't efficient enough. Um, it's too expensive. It's hard on the killers. So they transition to explore other options. Gas vans are one option. Eventually, they will settle on stationary gas chambers. Um, and for these, they will set up a series of death camps in Eastern Europe. Um, there'll be six of those of the 44,000 camps in occupied Europe. Only six of them are set up as killing centers. Um, the first of them, Helm No, will use the gas vans, but the stationary um, gas chamber systems are set up at Belzit, Sobibor, and Treblinka, later um, at Auschwitz and Majdanek. So gassing will begin really in the spring of 42. Um, months later, so the spring of 42, really the Holocaust as we know it is, is in full swing. Eight months later, news of that reaches the West. Um, so a representative of the World Jewish Congress in Switzerland is notified. He tries to tell uh, Rabbi Stephen Weiss in New York. The State Department blocks it as a war rumor. Um, eventually, in August, that does get through. And by late November, Weiss has gone to the U.S. press. And so as of November 1942, um, people in the United States are able to read about, um, again, we don't know all of the details. We don't know um, we don't know a lot of it, but we do know that mass murder of Jews is happening. Um, some of the details are wrong, but again, the crux of the story is available to the American public. Um, in 43, only 48% believe these accounts because people remembered the exaggerated accounts of Germany in World War I. Um, they distrust things coming out of Soviet territory because the Soviets notoriously lie and exaggerate. And in 42, a lot of our focus is in the Pacific. Um, and then if you, you know, go through, you can see lots of these um, newspapers, you know, these articles are included, even if they're on the front page of newspapers all over the country, around them is a lot of local news that people would have been interested in and war news um, that people would have been reading because they were worried about their relative that they would have fighting. So even though this is here for people to consume, it doesn't mean they necessarily read it and certainly they didn't comprehend the total meaning. Think how much news we are inundated with every day. You know, we scroll through our feeds, we see all kinds of things. Just because we saw it doesn't mean we read it and thought about it. Um, I won't show this video for time, but again, that's something you can see on their website. Um, there was a musical performance called We Will Never Die that debuted in Madison Square Garden and then toured across the U.S. Over 100,000 people saw it during the course of its run. Um, it's a, it's a large-scale cast production um, that calls attention to the murder of Jews in Europe. Um, and it's pretty specific in its details, and it was meant to raise awareness and demand action. Jan Karski, who is a member of the Polish underground, he gets out of Europe, comes and meets with Roosevelt and tells him about what's happening in occupied Poland. Um, FDR tells him, uh, basically, we need to win the war. The best way to help the Jews is to win the war. There's another demonstration in 43 of uh, rabbis that march on Washington and they're demanding action, not pity. So again, very visible, calling for some sort of action. Um, and I think a lot of this goes against what we've come to believe in the post-war world that suddenly, you know, when the allies liberated, you know, Dachau and Buchenwald, we're like, oh God, what, what happened to these people? But what we know is we can see there were, you know, there were parts of this story that were not only just known to people, but there was actual demonstrations to raise awareness for it. 
We know there was some State Department obstruction in terms of uh, attempts to keep out more refugees. Um, Breckenridge Long lies to Congress and says that we've let in almost 600,000 refugees, was less than 200,000. That's exposed. And then the War Refugee Board um, is created in 44. Um, there's an excellent book called The War Refugee Board by historian Rebecca Erbelding. If you're interested in this, I would highly recommend it. Um, goes into a lot of detail and talks about what this board did, what they were able to do, who they were able to save. Um, so it is one of the very positive things that we did during this time period. Um, they also help establish this um, refugee camp in New York where refugees are, are brought in. Um, eventually they will be able to become citizens. And this uh, is another quick video that I'll show you that shows where the Allies are war-wise in relation to what's happening in the Holocaust. So I think it answers a lot of questions that people have about what we did or didn't do. point of the war. But the road to this point has been long and hard. And every child here knows that Germany must finally be beaten on the continent. In North Africa, the Allied fences are slowly closing around the Germans and Italians. As Hitler frantically tries to hold on to prepare the defenses against an Allied invasion of South Europe. Allied troops landed on the beaches of Sicily. With this first penetration of Italian home territory, the fascist government of Italy collapsed. Here, under the guns of British and American artillerymen, began the assault on the mainland of Italy. Germans in headlong retreat, Yanks of the 5th Army enter Rome in triumph. The Atlantic Wall has been penetrated. There, after the first assault, the Allies clung precariously to a few beaches. But now they have a solid foothold on Fortress Europa. Red's armored division with new American equipment it speedily crushes the remaining Nazi resistance in the city, and the battle for Paris ends with the final turmoil of a series of clashes. Yank troops move up against heavy German counterattacks. All along the way, wrecked American equipment attests to the fury of the Nazi attempt to stall the Allied offensives toward Cologne and the Tsar.
This is the news for which the whole Allied world has been waiting. American troops made contact with Soviet elements near the German town of Torgau on the Elbe. The forces of liberation have joined hands. So no, that's a bit a bit long, but I think it shows you just visually so well where we were and how that relates to the murder of Europe's Jews. And you can see that, you know, by the time we land at D-Day and get a foothold in Europe, five million have already been killed. Um, and often people talk about the bombing of Auschwitz. And we have to think that we didn't have bombing range to get into those interior parts of, of you know, Europe until after most of them were closed. Um, some bombs do hit Auschwitz, but they're they're aiming for the IG Farben factory. But in, you know, mostly the opinion was winning the war as quickly as possible was the best way to um, help Europe's Jews. Just quickly can see some of the first reports of Auschwitz. These will come in July of 44. Um, and, you know, several reports across lots of newspapers. Um, this one is interesting because it says like, um, since December of 44, most Americans believe Nazi murder stories. Yes, yeah, 76% do. But when you look at the breakdown, only 4% only four percent believe that 6 million or more were killed. Um, or, you know, at that time it wasn't quite, well, I guess it would have been. Um, but most people believe it's 100,000 or less. So the numbers, people believe there's Nazi atrocities, but they don't have any sense of the scale. Genocide as a word is coined here during this time period as well. And just very quickly, we can talk in our final minutes. I promise I will save time for questions. We can see what liberation looked like. And that map, uh, that video showed you sort of, you know, the, the allies coming in from the West, the Soviet coming in from the East. The Soviets will be the ones to get Majdanek um, and also Auschwitz. Their liberation happens in the course of active war. They come across the primary killing facilities. We do not. They find very few survivors, and they provide almost no institutional support for um, those that they liberate. There's just a few images of the Soviet liberation of Auschwitz. Um, they stage these some days later after people are healthy and make them, you know, do several takes. Come to our own uh, Allied liberation. You can see that video showed it as well, sweeping across the the west of Europe, you can see as the army conquers territory, they liberate the camps that they find. Um, there's just some of the, you know, some of the, you can see the British, Canadian, American armies and the camps that they get. Um, a lot of these camps, especially Dachau, Buchenwald, Bergen-Belsen, get flooded with people from Auschwitz when the Nazis death marched people out ahead of the Red Army. They marched them into these Western camps. And so the scenes that our soldiers find um, there upon liberation, especially the piles and piles of bodies, um, are something, those were conditions that existed only at the very end of the war. Here's just a few photos of colorized liberation. Um, I think these are you know, we were so used to the black and white photos. I think the colorization is very striking and we see more deeply the toll on the human body. Um, active war is still happening for, you know, during the course of Western liberation, but it's at the end of war. Um, and so when our armies come through, we do find massive numbers of survivors, many of them needing desperate medical care. Many of them die after liberation because they're in such bad shape. But we do our best to provide an institutional um, high level of institutional support for those that we liberate, and we document it. There's lots of coverage in in the press in terms of you know magazines and newsreels. You can find lots and lots of coverage um, headlines. It's interesting here because before the headlines were um, you know Jews murdered, you know the word Jew is in the, lots of the headlines. Once liberation happens, now it becomes Nazi victims, human skeletons. What has humanity done? And the specific Jewish of it of this of it kind of slips away. Just briefly, Dachau, because this is an American one, um, you can see these are traditional scenes of liberation that we're, um, we're familiar with. So in addition to Americans getting information from you know, newsreels and newspapers, they also would be getting letters from people that they knew, um, their sons or husbands and cousins um, that would have been fighting the war and, and liberated some of these places. So in many cases, people might have a very firsthand account um, of people 
from people who witnessed this. After the war, America and the Allies will set up displaced persons camps throughout um, German territory. It's mostly America and Britain who are paying for these, and eventually the, the cost really comes to the U.S. Um, there'll be lots of people who are displaced at the end of the war, not just Jewish survivors, um, but certainly they're the ones in the worst conditions health-wise. Um, initially, all of these displaced persons, um, Jewish and non-Jewish perpetrator and Holocaust survivor alike, are all in the camps together. Eventually, President Truman will send um, uh, Earl Harrison to tour these camps, and he makes a report saying we absolutely have to separate um, the Jews into their own camps so that they can be better protected, um, which is what we do. Um, and then we fund those camps well into the 1950s. Eventually, Truman will order uh, immigration open up, um, and that will alleviate some of the, um, the pressure. But public opinion, December of 45, you can see that most people, um, you know, mo it's kind of split here. Uh, but 37% think that fewer people than before should be let in, 32 the same, so we don't see a, a big change in public opinion in terms of um, allowing more people into the country. So finally, our questions are, you know, what could have we done? Well, we learned about the systematic killing early on. Um, so opening up immigration, filling those immigration quotas could have helped. Um, but ultimately, these steps uh, would have reduced the death toll, but would not have prevented the Holocaust. And then what did the U.S. do? We won the war, um, established and funded DP camps, pushed Britain to open Palestine because many survivors, you know, all, almost all survivors wanted to leave Europe. Many of them wanted to go to Palestine. Many of them came to the U.S. Um, ultimately, we let in over 400,000 stateless refugees. And of course, then we also conduct uh, post-war uh, trials of criminals, unlike the Soviets who mostly just execute people somewhat immediately or um, without much of a trial, but we make a real effort, um, not just as an example of this is the justice that the West does, but it also lets us know about the Nazi system. It's the first time that we really begin to know how the system functions. So that is the presentation portion. Let me see how I get out of this, or maybe Samantha can end it. No, I can stop sharing. All right, I know that was a fire hosing of information for all of you, but we do have 10 minutes. So if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to um, go back or explain something more fully. So I cannot unmute you. You have to unmute yourself. Um, at the bottom of the, in the white screen, there's the little uh, microphone button. You can unmute yourself and talk. You can put your questions in the chat as we have one in the chat already. From the video, it looked like the Nazis closed some of their killing facilities years before the Allies arrived. Were they running out of people in the area to murder, or were they just consolidating their efforts? That's a great question. Um, and basically, the answer is both. So yes, they were mostly, if you can you see where those camps were located, um, they were taking people, the, you know, Jewish people from those regions and, and killed them in, in those camps. Um, and so when that area was clear, they did end up closing those areas. Uh, in some cases, like Belzitz, they ran out of room because they were first burying people, they ran out of room. Um, then places, uh, other camps, they've just sort of cleared that area. And then as the Soviet army is coming, they consolidate to Auschwitz. I can, as far as further resources, I would absolutely recommend you go to ushmm.org, um, the Holocaust Museum in DC, their webpage, and look through this Americans in the Holocaust exhibit. They have extra resources, letters from people. Um, there's just so much more on that, that site. So if you wanna know more about this, please visit their exhibit, it's great. I put the link in for your website, Shelley, at the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education as well in the chat. Great, yes. And also, of course, go to our website. Anyone else have a question? I don't know if I, I it, this said this on a slide, but I'm not sure if I specifically said it out loud. Our immigration policy definitely needed work. At the same time, we do let in more refugees uh, than any other country during that war period. So um, could have been a better effort, but at the same time, we, we did do, comparatively, we did do a lot. We have a question. One photo you showed of liberated camp prisoners 
They had a big letter X on their backs. What did that symbolize? So we're used to thinking about prisoners in camp uniforms that are striped, um, and many of them did wear that. However, there's certainly a point in many places where they run out of these uniforms. So prisoners would just keep their own clothes or just a regular suit, set of clothes, and they would have a um, a red X sewn or marked on the back, so they would be noted. So it just it marked them as prisoners, basically. So we have a question, are we recording this and posting it anywhere? Yes, we send it out to some editors. Um, and once the editing is done, it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. One thing I might recommend people do too, if they're interested, uh, and you could actually be involved in this project. There's something that the museum did called History Unfolded, and they called for citizen historians across the country to go to their own uh, newspaper archives and look for articles about the Holocaust um, that, you know, they're not, we couldn't just, you know, I we couldn't get them remotely. So everyone, you know, go to their uh, local newspaper and see what was your newspaper's coverage of Kristall and of any of these events during the 30s and let the museum know and they will add that to their collection. And so one, this is something you all can participate in if it's the project is still going on. And two, it's really interesting to read across the country um, to just search these events and a town that you may be from to see, you know, what was my town saying about, um, you know, Kristall in 1938, what, you know, you can see that. So I think it's just so interesting to see what America is, you know, what we, what we knew. We have a question. What are the top priorities today and for the future in Holocaust education? You know, it's, that's a tough one. It's interesting because I think one thing people like to point to is um, the, uh, the issue of survivors, you know, living memory of this will no longer be with us at a, you know some point soon um, and I think what I always tell people is we've done a good job of preserving and recording Holocaust testimony in the you know the past 20 or 30 years um, and now it's in the hands of historians so I think like you know keeping that transition going is important um, and also just thinking about not just Holocaust education obviously that's specifically this but humanities and history education in general um, that it has to be a priority that we we more broadly want people to understand our history, value that, um, and the Holocaust is certainly a part of it. But when we see surveys that say, you know, 20 per, you know, 60 percent of millennials don't know what Auschwitz is, um, I would say they probably don't know what Gettysburg is either, right? So I think there is a real lack of historic education and prioritizing that. And if we want to better protect our democracy and our future, we have to prioritize um, history education as a as a whole. I and this make, will come back. I'm sorry, Shelley. I want to make ahead. sure that our guests on the phone have an opportunity to unmute themselves and share a question. Um, if you're on the phone, you need to hit star six. If you'd like to unmute yourself and ask Dr. Klein a question, please do so. Um, we welcome it. I would add one thing to that last question as well. I think many places do have solid Holocaust education, but we have to work on building empathy. So it isn't enough that we know the statistics and we know the names of Auschwitz or, you know, Buchenwald, but we have to know the people themselves and the stories of those who were there so that we think about it in human terms and not just, you know, another, another number. You got a question in the chat, Dr. Klein. Someone wants to know if you give local presentations. Well, uh, where is local? <laughs> yes, Kansas City, absolutely. Uh, the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education does a lot of presentations. I do a lot of them myself. Um, I do a lunch and learn course um, as well. And so in the spring and in the fall, we, we, we run one of those. So if you have any interest in being added uh, to get on that list so you can, you know, I that what you saw today was a summary of a four to five week course I did on Americans and the Holocaust in general. So if that's something that interests you, please email me. Uh, my email is Shelly C, S-H-E-L-L-Y-C at M-C-H-E-K-C dot org. Or you can go to our website that Don put in the chat uh, and find more information and how to contact me there. 
Well, finding no more questions in the chat. Dr. Klein, I'd like to thank you. You always give us just amazing presentations and we are just absolutely grateful for your, for your um, insight and help and education. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to be with you. So before we go, I'd like to say a very big thank you to the Eisenhower Foundation. Um, the Eisenhower Foundation is our support organization and through them and through the Jeff Code Foundation, we are able to provide educational programming such as this. We have a few things coming up, a few programs coming up. Uh, we have our book talk next month where we will be reading Not Without Laughter by Langston Hughes. We will discuss it um, Tuesday, May 11th at 7 p.m. The Google Meet link will be on our website and in our Facebook, on our Facebook page. Our next Lunch and Learn is Advocating for Civil Rights in Eisenhower's White House. Um, we have Dr. John Morrow, who will be talking to us about E. Frederick Morrow, who was in the Eisenhower administration and supported and advocated for civil rights. Is that our last note, Samantha? That's our last note. So with that, I would like to thank you. Y'all have a great day um, and see you in a few weeks.